Greetings ladies and gentlemen, I'm GC Smith and welcome to day 7 of the official Eldritch Moon spoiler season. And boy do we have some good cards to take a look at today. But first I want to apologise for not doing any videos over the last few days. Uh, I've been very busy yesterday at least uh, for day 6, um, so unfortunately I wasn't able to film or release a video. That said, I'm going to be going through uh, the rares abo and above from the last few days which means unfortunately we won't be taking a look at any of the commons or uncommons, but we will probably get around to a few of them later in the week as we do the best of the rest videos. That said, let's get started with Providence. Five white white for sorcery with you may reveal this card from your opening hand. If you do, at the beginning of your first upkeep, your life total becomes 26. And its spell effect is your life total becomes 26. Now, I can see this card seeing play in sideboards for the aggro decks in a whole range of decks, because the idea behind this is you never cast it, you just use it to give you a 6 point life total swing uh, compared to other decks. Now, what decks would run this, do you ask? Well, control decks are running cards like Jacerin's Prodigy, when you don't mind having a card you can discard because you're drawing other cards. Car having cards like this in your sideboard isn't such a big weakness. They tend to say you'll actually see this card at all. Um, red aggro really shines in no way at all in comparison to the white aggro decks at the moment. And the white aggro decks have far more staying power and ability to push through damage than the red decks would normally have anyway. Which probably makes this card pointless. That said, if red aggro does become a thing because they normally lack a little bit of reach in some cases, this could see a bit of sideboard play. Next up we have Spear of the Hunt. One green green for a 3-3 three, three wolf spirit creature with flash and when Spear of the Hunt enters a battlefield, each other creature you control that is a wolf or werewolf gets plus 0 plus 3 until end of turn. This is a really nice and powerful uh, rare for the werewolf and wolf decks. And while I'm not expecting this to necessarily see that much play, there are other good 3 drops. Uh, and I don't think Werewolves as a tribe is particularly playable at the moment in Standard. This is a very interesting card for, say, Modern or more likely, actually, Commander, where people are running Werewolf decks. But it's still quite a nice card. It's a good bo body. Um, and if Werewolves does become a thing in Standard, then I could see this scene play easily, especially since it allows you to, you know, use Flash to allow you to flip your we Wolves and Werewolves, which is always the important thing. Next up we have Summary Dismissal. Two blue blue for a instant with Exile all other spells and counter all abilities. Yeah, this is Eldrazi counter spell. This is the way where blue is getting to counter Eldrazi. And it's the only good blue spell in recent... Spoilers, really. Uh, there are other reasonable blue spells in the sense of there are reasonable cards that have blue in them. And a couple of other blue cards. Like, this is the only one, for me anyway, that's any really good because I love control. And having a card that's like a cyborg-worthy counter-target Eldrazi is always good. The fact that you can let them trigger everything involved and then go, it's all gone, right? Which is important and I think is necessary in this format where they go, Hey, let's give Eldrazi all this stuff to help them uh, survive being countered. And then give them a land that shoots more Eldrazi so they can keep the cycle going like almost infinitely. Yeah, there were a few miss... Well, there were a few problems with all that really in my opinion. Still, I really like the fact we're finally getting a counter spell that hits them. And though I do wish it was one, one, uh, one blue blue so it could actually see play, you know, as a regular counter spell. It's still a good card nonetheless. Next up we have Ishkana Graft Widow. Four and a green for a legendary creature spider that's a 3-5 with reach and delirium. When this creature enters the battlefield, if there are four more card types amongst cards in your graveyard, put three 1-2 green spider creature tokens with reach onto the battlefield. Oh, and for six and a black, target opponent loses one life for each spider you control. I kind of like this card. It's a black-green commander for spider tribal is really its entire purpose um, and arguably for that tribe it's better than the werewolf was for their tribe really uh, this really promotes uh, having synergy with your other werewolves or well, with spiders sorry so it actually cares about you ha having your type and while it's not necessarily a particularly powerful um, tribe being able to burn someone for a huge amount of life at seven mana is not bad at all in commander obviously this is never going to see any standard play but you know, not every card does. 
Next up, we have United Resistance. One red red for a sorcery with Escalate, uh, and its Escalate cost is just one generic mana. And it has choose one or more. Uh, target player discards all cards in his or her hand, then draws that many cards. United Resistance deals four damage to target creature, and United Resistance deals three damage to target opponent. Boy, I love this rare. It's a red burn spell that can be used uh, to burn a creature or player. And has different values for each because, well, that's relevant. But more importantly, however, is this first mode, in my opinion. Target player discards a hand and draws that many cards. This is going to be so amazing in a Sphinx's Tutelage deck for the next few months. I love this card. I absolutely love it. And I so want to like try and get hold of four of them very quickly when um, uh, the set comes out. So I can build a blue-red Tutelage deck and just watch my opponent squirm as I use a card like this to rip them apart. Being able to get at least, uh, I, well, depending on how much your hand size is, but you should be able to get a reasonable amount of uh, cards, uh, triggers from this. If you're casting this turn through four, most likely, because you've already, you know, played tutelage, you get to kill a creature and you get to do uh, the whole cycling thing. So that's very, very good. Besides that, it's a four mana burn, uh, three mana deal four damage to a creature, which some decks actually want. And could actually really, really damage uh, other things. In fact, it also can hit Planeswalkers, arguably, as well. Because you can redirect to a Planeswalker, I think, anyway. I may be wrong slightly with how it's worded. But I think opponents and players can be redirected to Planeswalkers. So for four mana, you can kill a creature and arguably a Planeswalker, possibly. Although not necessarily that easily. Still, I like this card. And I, you know, I just think it's such a good card. Next up, we have an absolutely amazing card, Liliana, The Last Hope. One black black for a three loyalty Planeswalker Liliana with plus one up to one target creature gets minus two, minus one until your next turn. For minus two, you put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard and then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. And for minus seven, you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, put X2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens onto the battlefield where X is two plus the number of zombies you control. This is such an insane card, and I know so many people are saying this card is meh, which, by the way, were all the same people that said Jace Rins Prodigy is awful. This is a black Jace Rins Prodigy, right? Its plus one is the same, its minus is pretty much the same, just shifted to a different color pie, which makes sense, and its minus seven is just winning you the game. Like, if you have the minus seven, if you have the emblem out, and as long as you survive a couple of turns, you're probably winning that game. This is an incredibly powerful Planeswalker, and it fits in so many different archetypes. Obviously, it fits in the black-green uh, mid-range deck, the uh, black-green mid-range deck, and we've had some really good spells for that deck recently. Uh, but I also think it fits in a black base control strategy. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, minus two, you don't really want to return creatures in a control deck, which is not entirely true. Control decks at the moment, at least the ones that are good, have to be very proactive, which involves not only planeswalkers, but creatures. And you have so many good creatures that you'd want to return in that kind of deck because they'll die really quickly. Things like Jace, Rin's Prodigy, uh, Dob Goblin Dark Dwellers, which, by the way, is such a hilarious return. I love returning a Goblin Dark Dwellers with Liliana the Last Hope because you could probably get to cast Goblin Dark Dwellers and get back a spell again. It's such a nice card. And, uh, yeah, I just love Liliana. Awesome card. And I think so many people are under-hyping this card, even if it is pre-ordering for, like, 20 quid. Like, I wish I could get this, like, cheaper with all the hate it's gotten, but no, it's such a sweet card. And continuing on with the story of Liliana, we have Oath of Liliana, because, of course, she's joining Oath of the Gatewatch. For two and a black, you get a legendary enchantment with, when Oath of, the, uh, when Oath of Liliana enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a creature. And, at the beginning of each end step, if a planeswalker enters the battlefield under your control, this turn, uh, put a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature onto the battlefield. Now, this Oath is probably one of the more playable Oaths out there, apart from, say, Oath of Jace and Oath of Nyssa. Um, which I guess isn't a saying a whole lot, you know. Um, some of the oaths are pretty awful. Uh, but this oath is really, really good in certain types of decks, and it's more playable outside of the Super Friends deck, because at the very least, it's a sorcery speed removal spell, right? Now, unfortunately, that doesn't make it playable enough. There are other sorcery speed removal spells that are just better, such as Ruinous Path in this format, and even that's not amazing. Um... 
I mean, I guess in the Super Friends deck, this is good because it's removal and it gives you uh, tokens to defend the Planeswalkers that you just played, which is actually really good. It makes even the worst Planeswalkers playable because they can now defend themselves. I still think this card's pretty sweet. Um, and I love the flavor of Lidiana coming in with a zombie. That's really good. Um, but yeah, I just really like... Um, oh, okay, I really like this card. I think it's neat. I don't think it's broken, but I think it's neat. Next up, we have Selfless Soul. For one in a white, you get a 2-1 flying spirit creature with Sacrifice Selfless Soul and creature to control get indestructible until end of turn. This is probably a really essential piece of the blue-white spirits deck. The unfortunate thing is that Languish is the board wipe of choice in the format. If we did get another sweeper though, like a good 4-mana white sweeper, or a good 4-mana sweeper that wasn't Languish, or a good 5-mana sweeper that was playable and had a way to slow the format down, Selfless Soul would fit right in the Spirit deck as a way to flash in and then give your entire team indestructibility. Such a nice card, uh, 2 mana as well. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, you know, why wouldn't you run um, Avacyn? But Avacyn doesn't really have as much um, tribal synergy. But more importantly, sometimes you just want to be able to play spells uh, in your turn as well. And other kinds of spells. And having a 2-mana creature that does a similar effect to a 5-mana creature is probably a better way to go in some strategies. Obviously, Avacyn is the more powerful spell overall, but this is such a nice card as well. Unfortunately, I guess Avacyn kind of means we're never going to get a good board wipe, or is a reason why we should get a good board wipe, I think, because Avacyn makes all the other board wipes terrible. Anyway, moving on, we've got Deploy of the Gate, or Deploy the Gatewatch, sorry. Four white white for a sorcery at Mythic Rare, with a look at the top seven cards of your library. Put up to two Planeswalker cards from among them onto the battlefield, and put the rest on the bottom of the library in a random order. This card is incredibly powerful if you get to it and you've built your deck correctly. If you're able to survive long enough to deploy this, you are going to run away with the game, quite likely. Unless you're lucky get like me, who played against a deck that ran away with the game like this and got their um, Tamiyo to 7, and you go, I'll play a Salum Dragon Lord Salumgar, steal your Tamiyo, minus 7, play a Dragon Lord Salumgar, steal your Planeswalker, or sacrifice this, or, or you know, it's uh, on two, okay, minus two, your Liliana, I get back my other Dragon Lord Slumgar, just keep cycling in some way. That was such a sweet game, that was. Um, but yeah, no, Deploy the Gatewatch is such a great card, I absolutely love it. Um, and again, no, I'm not sure how powerful this will be in the standard format as a whole. Uh, you need to slow the game down a lot, and you can die by turn four or five already in so many other. Uh, decks. So against like um, Blue White Humans, Bant Company and all these different decks, you can die before you can even deploy the Gatewatch. <laughs> uh, deploy, deploy the Gatewatch I guess. And uh, I don't know if deploy the Gatewatch actually does enough to catch you back up because there aren't many Planeswalkers that just end the situation on the board. I guess Chandra's one, but I don't know. I, I don't know how this will fit in. The deck you want to run is probably a green-white deck, and that deck probably isn't running enough single-target removal to stall the game long enough to survive for a very good length of time. So we'll have to wait and see how that works out. Probably a great commander card nonetheless, though. Next up, we have Crypt Breaker. One black mana for a 1-1 one, one zombie with pay one and a black and tap and discard a card, put a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. And then you can tap three untapped zombies you control to draw a card and lose one life. This is a sweet card, and it reminds me so much of a card called um, Heritage Druid. Okay, it's not a Heritage Druid. It has so many costs attached to it. But the fact that you can play this, tap free zombies, and just draw cards is pretty sweet. The fact this is also a way to just generate a load of zombie tokens, again, is really, really good. This is just a, such a powerful one-drop for a zombie tribal deck, and if zombie tribal does become a thing in standard, this will be a linchpin of that deck. Next up, we have Grim Flayer. Black and a green for a 2-2 human warrior at Mythic Rare with Trample. And when Grim Flare deals combat damage to a player, look at the top three cards of your library. Put any number of them into your graveyard and the rest back on top of your library in any order. And it has Delirium where it gets plus two, plus two. Yeah, this is insane, Grim Flare. Uh, another Goyf imitation in standard with uh, Sylvan Advocate is insane. Now, I'm not saying this is a Goyf. Uh, this is clearly... Far inferior to Goyf in many ways. Doesn't get as big. Um, 
has a lot more strings to jump through to get there. But boy, in standard, this is very close to where Goyf would be in modern. Um, and it's just, I don't know, with Sylvan Advocate already, I just feel that this could be a very oppressive card to be with. Um, Green-Black is already such an oppressive combo, but there is one great thing about this. It only gets up to four toughness naturally, which means Grasp of Darkness still kills it. And that's... Oh, and Languish still kills it. So it is a far more balanced card against the removal that exists in the format, and I think that's essential. It's a very powerful card, and I think Black-Green are going to love this deck, uh, this card. And I think this card might contribute to Black-Green being a deck, but it's still a very, very powerful card. Next up, we have Mirrorwing Dragon. Three red red for a 4-5 flying dragon at Mythic, with whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell that targets only Mirrorwing Dragon, that player copies that spell for each other creature he or she controls. Each copy targets a different one of those creatures. Now, this card is amazing against com control. Now, I know what you're thinking. People are probably misreading this card at the moment or mishearing what I say. No, no. If a control deck targets this removal spell, or any deck targets this removal spell, they will wipe their own board at the same time, unless that removal spell also targets a different creature. This is such a powerful card against the green-white decks, where the only way to really kill this in their deck is Dramokus Command, and it's not killing this. There's very few creatures in their deck that can actually fight Mirrowing Dragon profitably, but if they try and exile Mirrowing Dragon, they're exiling their entire board as well. Um, so, <laughs> this is such a powerful card. And finally for today, Mind's Dilation. Five blue blue for a mythic rare enchantment with whenever an opponent casts his or her spell for the first time each turn that player exiles the top card of his or her library and if it's an online card you may cast it without paying its mana cost this card is great in commander don't get me wrong but my tone of voice this card is amazing in commander where it slots in i'm just incredibly disappointed i wanted how else do i put this i want blue to be a thing in standard and they keep claiming that jace uh rinse prodigy is the reason why it's not and then they keep printing green three drops or white three drops that fit into the Coco decks with Collector Company. And I have to say that they're lying. If they're saying they're worried about Jason's Prodigy, but they keep printing all these things for Company or Green White Humans, all these other decks that are already obliterating the format as it is, then they're clearly not worried about Jason's Prodigy. Or at least they're not testing properly. Blue needs a good mythic. Come on, we've had Clone Legion recently you know, last year. That card was trash, and yet we're getting Mind Stylation again? Like, you know, similar style thing? Okay, Mind Stylation is better in Commander than Clone Legion ever will be. That's fine. It's a great Commander card. But why is this Mythic? Seven mana, you're never really going to hit that in Limited easily in the deck, and even then it's not that powerful compared to some of the other rares in the format. I don't know. This card's just awkward, and if this is the only blue, mono blue Mythic we get... I'm incredibly disappointed. I just want blue to be a thing. I want control to be a thing in standard again. So yeah, anyway, those are the spoilers for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Uh, look forward to tomorrow where I'll definitely be staying on top of things um, because I know I have the time to do so. So thank you very much for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.